Thanks for tuning in to the Candlewick Press and Walker Books U.S. Young Adult Panel. We'll be talking about young adult books, clearly. Uh, I'm Maggie Takuda Hall. I'm the author of The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea. And I'm very excited to be in conversation with two A-list authors, uh, Clara McFall and Alexandra Lee Young. I'm so happy to be here with you both. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So... Uh, Claire, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. So um, I am a young adult author. I am from Scotland, which is why I sound kind of funny. <laughs> and uh, I used to be an English teacher for 10 years. And then I started writing books that I thought my pupils would want to read. And then eventually the, uh, the books did well enough that I could um, escape the classroom. <laughs> I mean, retire with crying and, and heartbroken and all that sort of stuff and escape. And, uh, and, and now I get to just write books full time. And uh, just before the pandemic, I moved to Colorado, which is absolutely gorgeous. And it looks beautiful from my living room window. And I'm sure one day I will go out and explore it. Hopefully soon. Soon it'll be good. Soon, soon. It's happening. Soon it'll be here. <laughs> Alex, can you tell us a little more about yourself as well? Yeah, um, as you can see, the brick wall behind me, I live in Brooklyn. Um, I'm originally from San Francisco, California, where um, like in college, I got started, my career got started in the music industry. I went on tour with a bunch of bands. Um, and then I moved to New York City in my mid twenties where I worked at a music recording studio and that got me into podcasting. And my first podcasting episode I ever made was about um, K-pop and the first paparazzi company in South Korea. And that's what I ended up writing my very first uh, YA novel about, Idol Gossip. Um, and here it is, if you wanna see it. Um, hmm, and Idol Gossip. <laughs> And um, now I work at the New York Times where I make a podcast called The Daily. I'm such a daily so fan. so much less cool now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no way. Claire, don't worry. No <laughs> musical band has ever invited me anywhere if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> um, so to ease us into a conversation, I always think it's nice to do an icebreaker. And my favorite icebreaker is one where I get to feel comfortable and make you guys feel really uncomfortable. So the way that this is going to work is I'm going to do a quick fire round with each of you. And the rules of the quick fire are you don't get to think about your answer and you don't get to explain yourself. Are you ready, Alex? I'm going to start with you. Coffee or tea? Tea. Dogs or cats? Oh, dogs. Vampires or werewolves? Vampires. Netflix and chill or Hulu and hype? Uh, Netflix and chill. Arsenic or grenades? Oh my God, arsenic, arsenic. <laughs> Taylor Swift or Ariana Grande? Ariana Grande. Okay, you can only eat everything with a ladle or every time someone says the word and, you sneeze. Oh, ladle, <laughs> ladle 100%. Okay, Claire, are you ready? Yes. Okay, coffee or tea? Neither. It wasn't an option, but okay, I'll allow it. You're a maverick, that's what I'm getting. Dogs or cats? <laughs> Dogs. Werewolves or vampires? Werewolves. Netflix and chill or Hulu and hype? Netflix and chill because that's the one I know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenic oh, or grenades? Werewolves. Grenades. Okay. <laughs> Taylor Swift or Ariana Grande? Taylor Swift. You can only eat everything with a ladle from now on or every time someone says the word and you sneeze. I'm totally gone for the ladle, absolutely. Man, I would have gone for the sneezing, but okay, it's fine, it's fine, this wasn't about me. Very popular word. <laughs> uh, yes, that's true. Um, so I'm so excited to talk to you both about two like pretty wildly different books, um, but also I feel like fantasy books in their own ways. Um, so Alex, could you tell us a little bit about Idle Gossip? Yes, um, Idol Gossip is about a Chinese American girl who is from San Francisco who moves to South Korea with her family because her mom's a diplomat and her greatest dream in life is to be a famous singer. And while she's 
just goofing around in um, uh, Anorebang, a K-pop like um, a place where you can sing ka um, karaoke with her little sister. She gets discovered by one of South Korea's biggest K-pop entertainment companies. And from there, she has to kind of navigate the ins and outs of fame and big time egos and the other girls in her girl group. And she also has to navigate a pretty snarky, um, scary blogger who riles up some anti-fans against her. So that's that's what Idol Gossip is about. Great, and Claire, can you tell us about Fairyman? Yes, I'm gonna do my sneaky, here's my cover. It's so pretty. Uh, Fairyman, yeah, <laughs> is a retelling of the Greek myth of Charon, who was like the fairyman for hate. Uh, basically, you might have heard of when you die, like they put pennies over your eyes. And that was so that you had the money to pay the fairyman so that you could cross the river Styx and Asheron, which are the rivers of misery and pain. So you didn't really want to swim. And, uh, and if you couldn't pay, then your soul would wander lost and lonely. Um, forever along the shores. So this is kind of a modern retelling of it. And the main character is a girl called Dylan and she's from Glasgow in Scotland and she lives with her mum, but they don't particularly get on. And she has spent ages whining and trying to get uh, her mum to let her go and, and meet her dad, who she's not seen since she was really, really small. So she's finally allowed to take the train up to Aberdeen. And uh, spoiler alert, it's a novel about the afterlife. So we go into the tunnel and we do not come back out again. And when she wakes up, like the crate, the train has been absolutely crowded and she's completely on her own. So she just kind of thinks they missed me. I was under some bags, it was dark. She crawls out and is expecting to see like paramedics, firemen, all that kind of stuff. And instead there's just one person sitting on a hill and um, his name is Tristan. And he convinces her that he was on the train as well and that he can get her to safety and you know maybe she can salvage some of the weekend with her dad but um that's actually a lie uh he was not on the train and uh, she is no longer in the normal world the reason that she was on her own is because she is the only one who has died and he is her ferryman and his job is to get her across the wasteland to the other side and the wasteland is full of these kind of demonic figures and it's kind of i guess a bit like a snail without its shell once you've lost the protection of your body your soul is really long and if you die there, you like properly die. So that's what we're talking about. Claire, that's cool. so cool. Yeah. Really cool. I have to say, Claire, it's like such a fast paced story. Um, and by chapter two, we already have a catastrophic train crash. We know that our protagonist is reuniting with her long lost father. How did you think about pacing when you wrote this? Um, kind of what could be a slow story wandering around a wasteland? You know, interestingly enough, like it didn't actually start originally at the start. It started at the beginning of chapter three, which is literally when she just wakes up from the train crash. Um, and I only kind of went back and fed in the bit at the start. And I think the trouble with the story is there, there only are two characters. It's him and her for a lot of it. And so I didn't want you to get bored, I guess. Um, uh, so there's, um, it's just, I think I, I wanted to get through the real world and into the afterlife because that's where the real story is it's actually almost becomes less about her and more about him as the novel goes on um the book has been released in in china and a reader in china actually said a really really interesting thing to me um they said at the beginning of the story you think that she's his fairy man but actually as the story goes on it becomes more that she's his fairy man and kind of a savior in a different mm. way so i think i got off track on your question there i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a fascinating answer. <laughs> and Alex, you uh, got inspired to write Idle Gossip from your first podcast radio story, but can you tell us a little bit more about that assignment? Yeah, I. it's funny. I was just kind of like getting, I was done with my advertising career. I was moving into a new phase of my career where I wanted to do something a little bit more exciting and creative. And I moved to South Korea because I ended up getting... Um, an artist residency with a small artist residency there in a place called Dong Incheon. And um, there I just spent like seven months um, reporting on the, the K-pop industry. And I met the, the first paparazzi company there called Dispatch. And I met a bunch of fans and I kind of fell in love with the music. And then I had a story ready to pitch to the, po the podcast called Radio Lab, which is where I ended up publishing the episode. That sounds like such an amazing experience. That's just it awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Claire, 
so you based uh, your story on Greek mythology. Did you do research on any other world mythologies or anything when you were creating the wasteland? How did you come up with your demonic creatures and the like? Bits and pieces came from kind of bits different places. So the Tristan character came from Greek mythology. <laughs> the wasteland actually came from um, the, the Scottish landscape. And I know Scotland's really famous mm -hmm. for its landscape. It's all hills and heather and brigadoon and mists and all that sort of stuff. And it's beautiful. Um, I actually didn't live in the Highlands. I lived in the Lowlands and the, the Scotch borders. And it is really, really, really gorgeous from the car. But when you're not in the car, it's kind of windy, it's kind of cold, it's kind of rainy. And you know how I'm kind of not very fashionable and I wear those like foot like jeans that go on the ground. And you know when the water starts seeping up and up and up and up and up and all of a sudden you're soaking from the knees down and there's no signal at the, you know, in the middle of the countryside. So I was driving from Inner Leven, which is a wee town in the borders. And I was driving all the way to Les Mahigo. These are, these are very Scottish places, aren't they? Uh, and uh, to teach. <laughs> And it's about an hour's drive and there was literally nothing in between apart from me and these hills and so I just saw all the bleak really harsh weather like all the rain sleeting down and so the wasteland kind of came from that because it is kind of bleak the idea of if my car breaks down it's going to be so miserable and then the race themselves actually <laughs> really funnily came from the film Ghost. Do you remember Ghost? Patrick yeah. Spicy and the Potter yeah of wheel course they do. Formative. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit where the bit of Getting or where Carl dies, uh, you know, when the, the, the thing comes down and, sh yes. and then like his soul pops out and he's kind of looking around like, what's happened? And then you just hear these moaning, creepy noises. And then if you haven't seen Ghost for a while and you rewatch it, the CGI is not the best. It doesn't look amazing now. It looks kind of you're like, oh, that's not a creepy ghost. But when you were 10, which I think I was when I first watched it, it was absolutely terrifying. So in my head, these things, these kind of smoky things coming up from the ground was just what I associated with kind of fear. So I just mm. built bits and pieces from different stuff that I had in my brain. Did you slip the line, you're in danger, girl, anywhere in Fairy Man that we should know about? I really wish I had. I really wish I had. <laughs> You know, I'll just like slide it in on a page somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can use that when you know when you personalize the books to people. Uh, <laughs> for both of you, uh, Alex, having grown up in San Francisco and having your main character also be from San Francisco, and Claire using uh, the Scottish landscape as the basis for the wasteland, how do you feel like your backgrounds and your identities affected your work? Yeah, well, I'll say that I, um, I mean, I lived in South Korea for about the same period of time as my main character lived there until she was fully like um, boarding at the entertainment school um, company that she was training at. And I used a lot of my own experience and her experience, this feeling of like, you're a little bit of a fish out of water and you know people are very curious about you like as a Chinese American person myself people would ask me like are you Korean are you Korean American what are you and and I would have to kind of explain they knew I was American but they didn't quite understand and sort of this feeling of like you know some of this is very familiar to me because I've traveled in Asia a lot but some of, so much of it is not familiar to me because I've never lived in you know this part of the world before so um, yeah, the, a lot, a lot of my experience there. And then just kind of like there, she, my main character, Alice, she has like a slow realization over the course of the book that she doesn't know the whole story. She knows her own perspective, but she's forgetting to see the perspectives of those around her. And she starts to feel like she's very isolated. And I think I had the same feeling when I lived there as well. Like if I just turn, instead of like turning my isolation, isolation in on myself if I just turned myself outward and understood how people were seeing me or how people might be experiencing my own like ignorance because I wasn't South Korean um yeah that's where I had that sort of arc as Alice does in the book too yeah yeah and Claire um I think I think I, I took the the Scottish landscape and put it in the wasteland which is the kind of other world part of the book Mostly, I guess, to make it more believable, because when you're writing fantasy, um, it's it's because because real world fantasy, you start off and you're in just like normal Glasgow, and it's not like um, you expect strange things to happen. You don't expect a 
a zombie to pop out of a, a cupboard or something. Like if you're watching Harry Potter and you know that bit where um, he comes running down the hall and I think it's the first book, uh, Professor Quirrell, and he's like, troll in the dungeon, thought you ought to know. And everyone's accepting of that kind of thing because it's a fantasy landscape novel or a fantastic movie. Whereas this one was a real world movie and then I was at book, sorry, and I was expecting to pull you into a fantasy landscape and not have you roll your eyes and go, well, that's total nonsense. So by kind of using, I guess, the landscape that I knew really well and hopefully could portray authentically, hopefully, um, it made it hopefully feel more real so that people were more likely to go along with a fantasy element because it didn't feel like things were suddenly going crazy. Um, and I, I like writing what I know because I, it, I guess it's just a comfort zone thing. And I like presenting Scotland to other people. So all of my characters are pretty much almost always Scottish because I know how to be Scottish, <laughs> obviously. But also I think sometimes the bits of Scotland that go out to the rest of the world can be a bit cringe. You know, bagpipes and kilts <laughs> and stuff like that. And, you've got red. <laughs> and so it's nice to just kind of show a real Scotland to people and say, you know, we don't all have tartan bonnets, honestly. Um, and just let people just meet actual Scottish people and live in their world for a little bit. So, and I don't think I would do characters from other places very well. <laughs> well, I think what's so interesting that both of you guys are kind of touching on um, in essentially portal fantasies, this idea that you start in a normal world and then you kind of cross into this other place where the rules are different and you're an outsider and things are strange and there might be demons or maybe you're a pop star now, unclear, um, is that it, those stories require something to ground us back into like sort of the emotionally relatable. And I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about sort of how you thought about your character's psychology as you wrote your book. Like Alex, you kind of touched on this where she's realizing her world is opening up and that she's been looking at it in this particular way. And you know, that was close to your experience but she's also training to be a pop star. How did you kind of navigate that work? Yeah, the, it's funny because I think I, when I first started writing Alice, um, I was very influenced by the books I was reading at the time. One of the books I was reading, I always talk about Rainbow Rowell in these interviews, but she was a huge influence on, on writing this book. Um, and I, I think there was like elements that I wasn't quite relating to in her, in Alice's psychology in the first and then like the first draft I would say and then I I just really had to recall how I myself felt when I was living in a, a foreign country in South Korea and I, I always remember there was this moment where I had been there for several months and I was talking about how like wow I just came into this country and everyone was so nice to me and like I I couldn't believe it and and a woman was saying a woman just said to me you know um, did it ever occur to you that's because you're American and like you just have a different like people are going to be different to you here um, and that I the person you're talking to might have a totally different experience relating to all the people you're relating to and I was just like oh my gosh like it never like I just felt so privileged in that moment it was like real epiphany for me and so I just I started to think about that as I wrote Alice and this, this idea that she was like, had a lot of tunnel vision, um, which I myself experienced when I was there. And I think we all kind of do when we're feeling like fish out of water. Claire? I think it's a bit uh, different in, in Very Mom because when she goes through the portal and she's then in the fantasy world, she doesn't actually understand or realize what's happened. And the only other character around her is lying to her about the fact that she's moved into a different space, basically just in order to make his life easier. If she doesn't know she's died, she won't start crying. I won't have to put up with the whining. We'll just get there. It's fine. She doesn't need to know until we're actually at the bus stop kind of thing. And I guess what was, I had this really weird idea of, I know you, you see kids playing and they don't understand the role mortality and they're standing on top of the climbing frame where they could quite easily fall to the death, but they don't get that sense of danger. And I'm yes. always super rubbish <laughs> realizing you could die doing this. Um, so what was really hard was kind of the psychology of thinking if someone turned, if you were still here and you were you, or you thought you were you, and then someone turned around and told you, actually, that's not the truth. How would you deal with that? And I, I'm, that was really kind of a weird thing to try and imagine 
Um, I think what maybe made it easier for the, the character in the book is that actually when she's in the real world, she's, as you were saying, she's a fish out of water too. Even though she's in the place that she's grown up and she's kind of always been, she's an outsider. And that was really easy for me to tap into because I actually was born in England and my parents were Scottish and so they moved back to Scotland on my 10th birthday, which was a really fun birthday for me. And um, there's some tension between England and Scotland, I guess. I've, um maybe a leftover thing from hundreds of years ago when there was battles going back and forth. But there, there are tensions between the two countries. So to be taken and just sort of plonked in this quite rural country school with all these Scottish people who were like, oh, you're English. Um, it was it was really quite horrible and awkward. And it took me quite a long time to settle in. I had to learn to swear and talk in a Scottish accent really fast, which I did. Um, but I already had that idea of exactly how it feels to not fit in whatsoever and to feel the hostility of your environment. So actually, she has a harder time in the real world because she's in a, in a school in a place where she doesn't fit in and doesn't have very many friends. And when she moves into the wasteland, the only other person who's there actually gets her and, and can relate to her. So strangely enough, it's actually easier for her to deal with things after she's died because at least she's not battling the other people around her. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you could hang out with your main character, would you? I don't know. <laughs> it depends. At the start of the book, probably not because she's kind of miserable about, you know, things. Um, I think I based her quite a lot on me when I was still feeling sort of young and misfitty and a bit kind of, you know, when you're you're shy and a bit nervous about things. So rather than showing anyone that you're shy and nervous about things, you actually just pretend that you don't care. Um, and she's sort of in that kind of <laughs> element of puberty. So by, by the time she's, you know, gotten through the book and dealt with some really horrible things, and had to like, you know, toughen up a bit, she might be fun. But at the beginning, it'd be like looking at a mirror of me at 13, and I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's so funny you say that. I have the exact same answer, Claire, because you know, in the beginning of the book, it's so much like looking at myself. When, and I, I feel like if I hung out with Alice at the beginning of the book, I'd just be wanting to smack some sense into her, like, come on, like, you <laughs> see what I'm seeing, you know? And then by the end of the book, I, I, she's just a, you know, a, a generous person. And, um, I, you know, if I had to pick someone to hang out with in the book, though, it'd be her, her good friend, Sonia, or maybe her little sister, Olivia, but maybe not Alice. Yeah. I do think it's funny that, uh, especially young adult author authors, I feel like we tend to not want to be around our protagonists, but we love all of our side characters. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where it's like we put all the pathos and the angst into our main character. And we're like, oh, I don't want to spend any more time with you. I've already done, already done my time with you. Let me hang out with this girl. <laughs> so I do think that's sort of like a funny thing that happens. Um, so, OK, you wouldn't hang out with your book's protagonist. But if you could tell them one thing that you feel like would save them a ton of trouble and render your novel moot, what do you think that thing might be? You know, I, I, I know what it would be, but it would ruin the end of the book. Um, oh, okay, so. yeah, Don't, no spoilers. No that spoilers, means, we want everyone to pre-order and buy. Yeah, I'll, I'll Idle think gossip. of something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll think of something, I'll let Claire go first and then I'll think of something yeah. else. Yeah, I mean, I think Bella, you know, don't, don't get on the train, take an Uber. <laughs> yeah. But then maybe it's like final destination, you know? When it's your time, it's your time, and just something else is going to happen. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, if she doesn't go on the train, we could skip like the whole 300 pages. <laughs> That's true. That's so real. But she does get on the train, so you can pre order and buy Fairy Man <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> so we have a little bit of time left, and I wanted to know from both of you if you could tell me what your dearest hope for what readers would take away from your book, what that would be. Uh, I feel like that's such a nice place to end. Um, Claire, could you kick us off? I guess I've got kind of three things that I'd like to say, and I'll make them really short so it only counts kind of like one. Imagine them as tiny little thirds. Uh, well, first off, I, would, I just, I hope they like it. It's, it's a tiny slice of my brain. It's a tiny slice of my soul. And it's a tiny slice of my home that I don't live in anymore. So I, I hope they read it and they enjoy it. Um, the second thing is I kind of hope it makes 
people think, I probably don't think enough about what happens after you die and what the kind of cultural ideas are in the world. And um, I'm just sort of hoping that I won't die yet and I'll have time to contemplate it in my retirement. But that's probably not a very good plan. So I guess just think about the whole thing. Think, just think in general, but think about, you know, what do you believe, what are beliefs, that kind of idea. Um, and then I guess the final thing is, um, People, I think, sometimes can get paralyzed by panic, uh, especially, you know, in the pandemic, even just something like, can I go back into the store and take my mask off? Is that OK? Can I do this? Can I do that? And quite often people avoid doing things because, they can't, because they're scared to do it. And in the novel, Dylan is kind of a person who is, you know, scared of her environment, scared of interacting with people. And I, you can would be the kind of one thing I would want them to take away from it determination can get you really 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 far so if there is something that you want to do or you need to do um go for it <laughs> and alex oh mine's gonna sound so bad after claire's um oh. <laughs> I, <laughs> um no there's 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 like two things i would say um one is i i and this is kind of relates to the question you asked before this like what would i say to alice um if i could tell her one thing and this is what i hope that readers take away too is, is that, you know, if you're faced with somebody who scares you or intimidates you or who you don't understand is just, you know, try and see them from an, a different angle. Try your hardest to see them from a different angle. Maybe they're scared too. Maybe they're worried too. And see where you can find some commonalities in that person. And it'll make them less scary and they'll make them more approachable. And the other thing that I hope people take away from this book is just, um, I, I think, you know, a lot of K-pop fans in particular, or just people who stand really hard for something, they get a kind of bad rap in the media. And I know, cause I work in the media and I want people to feel the joy and the complexity of what it means to be a celebrity and also to be a fan of a celebrity and specifically to be a fan of K-pop idols. Um, so I want people to come away with like a newfound or deeper love of K-pop and K-pop idols and their fanship. Amazing. And for both of you, where can people find you online? Um, <laughs> I am on Twitter at McFall underscore Claire, although I think if you just put Claire McFall in, I pop right up. And uh, I have a website too, which is just uh, ClaireMcFall.co.uk because I'm one of those British people. <laughs> uh, my website is just my full name, Alexandra Lee Young dot com. L-E-I-G-H is Lee. And then I have a very corny Instagram handle, which is a yo fo show. <laughs> <That's right. awesome. laughs> yeah, all my social media happens there. So amazing. Well, um, I'm Maggie Takuda Hall. Uh, you can also find me online at E M T E E H A L L on Twitter. Um, and if you're feeling spendy, please pre order Fairyman by Claire McFall and Idle Gossip by Alexandra Lee Young. And also, you know, if you're getting spicy, the Mermaid, the Witch, and the Sea, which I wrote. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you both thank for you all of your lovely answers. Bye. Bye.